Hey everybody. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we're going to talk about chapter two, which is directly related to culture. So we are going to talk about how culture really impacts how society um, interacts with individuals and individuals act with society. So we're going to go ahead and start this slide, start the slideshow. Again, I went past the questions because what I want to really get into is the material. Um, and I know that you guys can kind of look at those questions and make sure that you can answer them appropriately um, by the time you've done the reading and watch the lectures and things. Um, so before they even give a definition of culture, they start talking about a cultural appropriation. And it's really important because essentially this is when one um, group of people or person um, borrow or imitate or um, try to transcend boundaries of another group of people and their cultural, um, their sense of cultural belonging. Um, so, and they give some examples on the slide here of a non-Indian person wearing a sari or a non-Japanese person wearing a kimono. Another one is when you are doing any kind of Halloween stunt that has to do with indigenous persons um, or dressing up as, um, let's say, uh, like I've seen people dress up as Buddha or something of that nature. You're essentially taking something that is valuable and meaningful to a certain group of people and you're displaying it as um, as your own in some form or fashion, whether it's your own joke, whether it's your own um, sense of self, either way you're taking it and making it your own in a way that can be very harmful. Um, and even the most well-intentioned and seemingly benign decisions to borrow the cultural style of another group can be understood differently from those who are in the culture. Um, and so what essentially this is trying to get at is we wanna make sure that as we meld cultures or as we um, talk through our language, our space, our time, our, our, our literature, all of those things that we're doing so in, an, uh, in a way that um, both celebrates diversity and also acknowledges that um, there can be harm in um, in appropriating um, someone else's way of life. Um, so culture goes beyond just things like fine art or literature. It's really the values, norms, material goods that characterize a specific group. So what they mean by that is when you're in a specific group or have a specific identity. So um, like you're going to frame the way you interact with the world in a specific way that makes sense to your group dynamic. Um, and it's essentially the way in which you live in society, the way in which you talk, the way in which you act, the clothes you wear, um, the schools you end up in, the um, kind of housing you live in, the uh, material goods you can or you uh, can have or the material goods that you want to have, the aspirations that you have in life, um, the goals that you have, all of those things can be very, very much defined and related to our culture and our culture interacts with all of our institution, right? So you're gonna have culture very much interact with your religious institutions. You're gonna have it interact in your education system. You're gonna have culture interact with um, the way families operate, you're gonna, um, and what a family looks like. You're gonna have culture that um, interacts with um, law and the justice system, depending on what is valued, normed, what what is necessary for any kind of specific culture to thrive. So there is a wide variety of ways in which culture ties into all of these things um, that we're gonna talk about so, like over and over and over again through the semester. Um, Again, it refers to the way of life of an individual um, or groups within a society. And it can be thought as the design for living in the toolkit of practices, knowledge, and symbols acquired through learning rather than by instinct. So these are all learned behaviors. All of culture, including language, including um, morals, um, all of those things are taught, right? So um, when you come out as a baby, you are in no way, shape, or form already expressing cultural values. These are things that as you developmentally get into those phases in life, someone um, around you and, and multiple institutions impact essentially what that looks like.
Um, Non-material culture comprises of the non-physical things. So these are going to be your norms, your values, your symbols, your language, um, and your speech and writing. So these are things that everyone in the group really has access to or is taught. Um, and again, values are the ideas um, of what is desirable, proper, good, and bad. And the norms are really the way in which we interact as, um, with behaviors, um, given a range of social uh, situations. So norms, and I would say values too, can change over time. Um, and an example of this is how we've shifted um, from smoking being sophisticated to it being harmful, right? So they're giving that example. Another one, you can um, talk about really any major social issue and talk about how it is progressed or gone backwards or what have you in a in any different um, so like social situation. Um, so they work to, um, and so again, like you could use say, um, same sex marriage within a culture. Okay. Um, in America, over the course of the last probably four decades, we have gone from, um, a my, like a, a serious minority, um, wanting or approving of this, um, all the way to the vast majority of people. Um, now in this country, I think it's close to 80% um, are okay with um, same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. Maybe not in their, again, cultural religious institution, but as a whole, um, as a right for that person in society. And again, values and norms work together to shape how members of the cultures behave. And that's just coming down to um, talking about how um, you're going to form your behaviors your norm behaviors based on the values and morals that you shape your culture with, yeah? So language is a really important part of culture. Um, it's the, uh, like this says, it's the primary vehicle for meaning and communication in the society. Um, and it's a system of symbols, which is what they're gonna talk about, but these represent uh, what is valued most. They talk about who is valued most. They talk about the ways in which um, people communicate with each other. Um, language is very, very important and very, very key to understanding um, the society and how it operates. If you don't have language for something, it is likely not something that is valued or even not something that is considered really bad in society. Because if you don't have language for it, then it's something that is considered like ostracized or it's considered a non thing, right? It's considered a non-issue. And we'll talk more about language as we move through the course, because language is something that is incredibly important when we're talking about marginalized populations. Um, and when we talk about those in sociology, we want to make sure that we're doing so with language reflective of what those marginalized people would like um, in a way to make sure that we are not um, continuing generations of harm that have come to people. Um, in our own society. Human behavior is oriented towards symbols, again. So symbols and the way we name things, the way we label things, the way we interact with things is all based on whether or not we can um, apply meaning to it. And we apply meaning using symbols and words. So um, for example, learning how to drive, right? If you do not understand the symbols, like the stoplight, like the stop sign, um, if you don't understand the the language of the caution on some of the road signs, or you can't read the mile markers, you're going to have a really hard time both navigating where to go and or operating the machine as a whole because it also has symbols within it, correct? So all of these things in our society impact how we can do the functional things we need to do in order to... Um, achieve whatever it is we're trying to achieve, whether it is just getting groceries, whether it is, you know what I mean? So those those um, particular symbols and language especially is vital to even the most basic things that we, we do, even the most basic conversations we have um, with whoever it is that lives with us and so on. 
Um, and we get down to, when we get down to it, really symbols are what we use when we are also engaging with other people in society. Um, anytime we are exchanging goods and services, um, we exchange money. That money is a symbol of something. That money is just paper. But without that symbol, without that meaning, um, it detracts from its ability to um, be useful within the society. Okay. Um, and so... We're also going to talk about linguistic relativity, um, which is just a hypothesis based on theories um, that perceptions are relative to language. So what that means essentially is that we draw our own perceptions of something based on the language we use for it. So if we're using consistently negative language for a specific group or the, the higher people in society use specific language for a specific group, that group is going to be seen as that whether or not it is or not, because that has already had a perception. We already have this language tied to this entity or this this group or this person. And once we have tied that language to it, it's really hard to undo. It's really hard to override that, um, that systemic um, learned bias, if that makes sense. Sorry, my dog got surgery um the other day and she is very unhappy right now you gotta lay down sweetheart um so all societies use speech as their vehicle for language writing became a means um, of storytelling but it also became um a means of expression it became a means of teaching it became a means of um of all sorts of functions it wasn't just um, storing information from list. It was also um, it was also a way to convey something to someone, right? It was a way to convey this is what they had without um, having to do that. But also when we, we start writing language, we're learning that um, we're starting to make ourselves available to have time and space to record ourselves in a way that others can then find out about us. Um, and so that was really important in human history because it gave archaeologists, it gives scientists, it gives even within cultures today, it gives people the options to know and understand cult like a specific culture that is not your own even by being able to um, look at how they're communicating about themselves, how they're communicating to others, um, what they're displaying as their symbols, what those symbols mean to those people. And so that's a really good way of essentially learning about a any kind of culture, learning about any kind of people, um, and learning what matters to them and what their meanings are is based on their writing, based on their language, based on their symbols. Um, so material... Culture is the physical objects in a society that create influence. So these are things that are used to generate meanings. Um, so a, ve a vehicle is a, um, so any vehicle, okay, signifier, sorry. I was like, what is this? Is any vehicle of meaning of communication. So examples of signifiers include sounds we make in speech, um, marks we make on the paper, uh, manner of dress, pictures or symbols. So these are things that are going to signify something. They're going to show you something. They're going to do something. So these are, um, again, the things about a specific culture that are unique to them. So um, you have an example here of material culture and the things that the way they're dressed, the way their um, makeup is done, the way and the things that they're wearing. Um, it shows it shows that their their particular form of dress, their particular form of values is shown through how they're expressing themselves outwardly and the material culture they're choosing to put on themselves and or carry with them. Um, it is rapidly, material culture is rapidly becoming globalized largely through modern information and technology such as computer and the internet. And that's just saying essentially that we are granted a lot more options for material culture due to the um, ways in which communication over a large global frontier essentially was made possible by technology. Um, it allows different groups that aren't necessarily in the same area. Like, so good example of this and something that we do in our house um, is 
like, so a Trekkie, a Trekkie is going to be somebody that has a material culture that is surrounded by their understanding of Star Trek. But if you aren't in that group, if you don't understand that group, there's a good like portion of their memorabilia, their memes, their, um, the way they laugh at certain things, the way they communicate about the shows or what have you, that you're not going to understand. And you're not going to understand that because of that. But then there's this global frontier of technology that there's going to be somebody sitting in another country that can communicate as a Trekkie on maybe like a, a game board or maybe on a Star Trek um, fan website or what have you. You're going to be able to find these things in different groups that don't have to physically be located in the same space, but that's still going to have a cultural variation to it, if that makes sense. All right. Culture and society are closely connected. No culture can exist without society and equally no society can exist without culture. If you don't have values um, and norms, you can't have rules for your society. And you, then you don't have the ability to essentially like differentiate yourselves from any other group or society, if that makes sense. So a society is a group of people who live in a particular territory, are subject to a common system of political authority, and are aware of having a distinct identity from other groups. Culture also serves as a society's blue because culture is an important form of um, conformity. So essentially cultures, when we started creating culture um, as humans, we did so so that um, within that human evolutionary process, we did so so that our non-kin base, so people we were not related to, could work together as a unit to acquire, maintain, or um, to not fight over the resources that were available. And so we they needed a way to understand that somebody that was not family to me could still believe like me, still had the same morals, still had the same values, um, and that that was okay. So they were okay. We were okay. And that's how culture was formed. And the more people that entered that culture, the more likely they were to set up systems um, um, and they were more likely to set up institutions. And once you got to a certain point, that became a society, if that makes sense. Um, so is there an American culture? You can sit down with any anthropologist, any sociologist, and we will go over this for days. For days, <laughs> we will have this conversation. Um, and although the U.S. is culturally diverse, there are some characteristics that can be considered unique to American culture. And that is part of what our laws reflect. That is part of what, um, that is part of what makes the system work, right? So there are certain things. Now, does that mean that those certain things don't exist elsewhere? No. And does that mean that there are unique, there's, there has to be a unique, um, clothing style or a unique language even? No. Um, but what it does mean is that there are certain kinds of things that are similar throughout the U.S. Um, so the technology that's going to be around, the cars, the highway systems, the um, education system to an extent, um, there's going to be certain institutions that are going to be there throughout, right? So our policing system doesn't mean all Americans agree on how those institutions are run. And it doesn't even mean that um, those things are valued in the same way. What it means, though, is that as a society, we have chosen to stay here, be American, because we value our democratic process and we value um, what is currently, um, how it currently operates. Now, that does not mean that there are not people out there trying to change that. And that's intentional, right? That's part of the system we have created. And because we have created a system where that is part of being able to be part of um, protests, being able to be part of trying to make change or elicit change through a democratic process or through other means is partly um, part of that American culture, right? So even the resistance to what currently stands in our society is part of the cultural norm that is America, if that makes sense. Um, so how do we develop it? Okay, so I could go into this for hours because this is like my happy place in anthropology, but I'm not going to, so don't worry. Um, 
So the first humans evolved on the African continent over 4 million years ago. Um, culture enabled humans that were uh, with, they uh, to compensate for their physical limitations relative to other animals and freed humans from the dependence on um, instinctual genetic determined ways of responding to the environment. And it allowed us to cooperate, which I think is the biggest part of that, right? So um, humans have always been closely tied to their physical environment because they lacked technology um, to modify their immediate surroundings significantly. Um, so we've got a picture here. This is far more advanced than, than what they're talking about when it comes to early human evolution, um, because we're talking about the ability to show someone how to make a an arrowhead. We're talking about the, the very basic lines of communication. Um, this like being able to make a sound that says warning, warning, there's something coming. It's going to like get us or what have you. Those are the basic things that started to form little by little into what we would now talk about as culture and into groups that we would now talk about as a society. Um, so this nature nurture debate has raged for more than a century. Um, so were we shaped by our biology or did we learn the experiences through nurture? Um, there's never going to be an answer to that debate because humans are always going to have, always going to be impacted by their environment and also always going to learn things from other people. Because as a baby, we do not come out with all the information we need for society. Why? Because we are not developmentally capable of that at that point. Um, at the same time, depending on circumstances, physical means, depending on resources, we, depending on what the world looks like, that person is going to grow up in a different set of circumstances than if that same exact genetic person was born in 1920, was born in 1860, right? So all of those things are going to impact that, that child that person. Um, and there's no way to test how to completely and utterly take someone away from nurture or how to completely and utterly take someone on out of nature, because that's just not humanly possible at this point. And it's not something that should be possible because again, almost all sciences across the board are going to eventually get to it's both. Now, some are going to weigh that one has more influence than the other, maybe, but there still has to be both in order to create um, human culture. Um, so sociobiology is an approach that attempts to explain the behavior of both animals and human beings in terms of biological princes, principles. Now this one is, this is going to, again, favor that nurture side. It's gonna favor, or the nature side. It's gonna favor the fact that we are born with specific kinds of instincts and those instincts are gonna come out in this way. Um, they don't attribute, but this is key, they don't attribute 100% of their behavior to genetics. Um, and that's because you can't take away a person from society and have them be a person. They are going to be, they're not going to operate as a person would. Um, so we're going to get through this nature versus nurture slides, and then I'm going to pause and then I'll start another one in a minute because I need to attend to this poor little pumpkin over here. Come here. Hey. You're okay. Uh, most sociologists, again, think it's both. They do not assume that someone's um, governed by instincts. Instincts are fixed patterns of behavior that have genetic origins and that appear in all normal animals within a given species. Um, sociologists tend to argue strongly against biological determinism, which is this belief that differences we observe between groups of people, such as men and women, are explained wholly by biology. Um, rather they rather than trying to choose between nature versus nurture, sociologists now ask how nature and nurture interact to produce human behavior, which is what we were just talking what I was just saying, right? Um, and research studies have generally concluded that although genetics are important, how genes affect behavior largely depend on social context. So really what that's getting at is that um, as sociologists, we understand that the lived experiences that we, are around the teaching that we get taught by all of our different institutions, by all of our different interactions with others, really, really impact who we are as a human, right? Our experiences, our life affects 
who we are and who we will continue to be. Um, sociologist's main concern is with how our different ways of thinking and acting are learned through interactions with all the different institutions, right? Um, early child rearing is especially relevant when we talk about this kind of learning. So family ends up being one of the core main institutions um, and or whoever raises you ends up being the core main um, way in which we understand society because they're the ones that literally dress you, that like feed you, that teach you what food you eat, teach you what, all of those things are learned very, very young. Um, all cultures provide for childhood socialization, but what and how children are taught varies greatly from cultural to culture, culture to culture, sorry. Um, sociologists do not believe biology is destiny. And the reason for that is that um, there's so much document evidence that um, of change, of change depending on culture. So um, you react differently to your environment based on essentially what culture teaches you to how cultures teach you to react. Um, so we're going to pause there for just a second and um, then we'll get back to this um, in the second part of this lecture and then we should be pretty close to done. So I hope you're enjoying this. Again, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns or something doesn't make sense, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and ask, okay? So have a good rest of your week.